Hello, everybody. I'm Stephanie Curtis. I'm the director of programming for NPR News, and I'm thrilled that you're here for the final night of this great season that we've had of Talking Volumes. We couldn't do ta Talking Volumes without our sponsors, uh, Becker Furniture World and Great River Greening. And Great River Greening is joining us in the lobby tonight. Great River Greening is Minnesota's leader in nature-based climate solutions through land restoration. I don't know if you stopped by yet, but they have packets of hand-harvested milkweed seed so you can help lend a hand to the butterflies of Minnesota. So make sure you stop by and say hi to Great River Greening. We're going to have an in-person... <laughs> We're going to have an in-person book signing here um, on the stage after the um, conversation, so you can line up right there. And our friends at Subtext Books are in the lobby and have been selling books. So big thanks to Subtext Books. We would like to, of course, thank our partners in Talking Volumes, the Star Tribune. And Erica Pearson, a reporter from the Star Tribune, is here to join me on stage. Hello, Erica. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, what, everyone. What do you have to share with us? Well, I just wanted to say welcome to everyone and let you know you're in for a real treat tonight. I was lucky enough to interview Margaret for your program and for an article in the paper, and she will make you look at your own surroundings in a new way. I saw a toad hop in my backyard, and I thought, oh, I, I, uh, I just uh, appreciate that all, all the more. And um, to have a crowd of readers here, I do want to mention to look for some great books coverage in the Star Tribune coming up. My colleague Chris Hewitt has a really fun story on a couple from Minnetonka who have visited every single library in the Hennepin County system, 41 of them a tour to libraries. So look for that. I can't wait to read that. Thank you, Erica. Thank you. All right, let's get the evening started with the incomparable Carrie Miller. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the season finale of Talking Volumes. And, uh, you know, I think I've been saying this to some of you. This is always bittersweet for me to close the season because I experience something that our guest calls us to in her book. I rejoice because we've had these wonderful, intimate gatherings, and I've met new friends, and the energy has flowed through the room. And, you know, there's a little grief because it's going to be a whole year before we gather together again. So I'll put you all down for next season, season tickets, and I'll see you then. Uh, Margaret Rankel closes her book of essays with words that have come back to me many times, rejoice and grieve, grieve and rejoice. I love the kinship and the empathy in those words. She adds, do your best to help, bear witness when you can't. And that's where we'll begin tonight. Margaret Rankel is a writer and columnist for the New York Times. Her new book is titled The Comfort of Crows, A Backyard Year. Please give her the warmest of welcomes to the stage of the Fitzgerald Theater. I was thinking oh, what you wrote about having to really get used to loving winter and how we prepared for you with that, with a cold snap. I thought, boy, she's going to get a taste of it now. I looked out the window of the airplane <laughs> and I, everything was white and I just kept <laughs> looking and blinking and looking and blinking and finally I said to one of the flight attendants who was passing by, I said, excuse me, is is that, a, is that snow? <laughs> and he said, it is. And he was so, like, he looked like he was giving me a gift. Like he could, like he a could gift? tell really? from my accent that this oh, was magical to me. Oh my gosh. Was it magical to you? It was. It's awfully early, Margaret, in the season here. Listen, I was here in 2019 in the first or second week of October, and it was snowing when I left. <laughs> Oh, I thought, man. that is really early. See, we have a kind of amnesia. I don't even remember that. <laughs> it's, you know, every year in the summer and the fall, we kind of forget that when the boom lowers, this is what it's like. And this is what it's going to be like I for six months. I think it's magical in October and maybe less so in March. That could be right. I think that. Yeah. I think it's less so in October and November. <laughs> that's just me. Um, 
You know, I really love the juxtaposition of those words, rejoice and grieve, because I, I think they speak to your sense of awe and wonder. They speak to some hard-worn one experience. They speak to a little bit of idealism. And I'm curious about how you think of combining them, the, the, the sound, the contrast, as you were bringing the book together. It, it really wasn't even the book that did it. It's just that that's, those two feelings are so intertwined for me now. For somebody who grew up in the fields and the woods, wading in the creeks, to see what's happening to the natural world is inevitably to grieve. But it's still so beautiful. It'll still take your breath away. And so it's... It's hard to hold those two things mm -hmm. together in in one puzzled mind, but I think we have to do both. I think we have to permit ourselves to feel the joy, even knowing all the reasons we have for grief. Um, you have this wonderful... I'm thinking about a book that I read earlier this year by Dr. Keltner, Awe. How to find? Have you read it by I any chance? Read that one. You you seem to live the essence, the spirit of this book, because awe doesn't have to be. I went to this amazing place and I had this kind of out of body experience. Right. It really is seeing your life and your environment anew, with um, with kind of fresh perspective, and somehow you have learned how to do that. I'm curious about whether that's something you came to later in life or is this something that you think was cultivated um, as a child? I don't really know the answer to that question. I just am, have always been a, a window gazer. I've always been a daydreamer. I've always been a watcher and a listener. And when you're paying attention, that's that's the only way to feel. I think the people who don't feel that awe are just not noticing. But once you notice, that's the only reaction that makes sense. You know, um, Anne Lamott has, she says there are three prayers. There are only three prayers in the whole world. And it, one is please, one is thank you, <laughs> and one is wow. <laughs> and I'm just really good at wow. I think I was just born set to wow. Yeah, but I, I don't think that is the... I mean, there's a lot of ways to look around a world that is warming and experiencing what we're experiencing and to get really caught up in knowing that insects are dying and animal species are going extinct you have found, I mean, and as I was talking to people in the audience, this is what is so appreciated. You have found this way to hold those two ideas simultaneously, but to never let the grief be overwhelming. Sometimes it all. is. I think is sometimes it? it is overwhelming. Um, what happens when you feel overwhelmed? And in, in, for me, in my personal experience, when the macrocosm is overwhelming, mm -hmm. the only thing to do is focus in to the microcosm. Because whatever the headline says, I have a pollinator garden, and it's full of pollinators. And so going out there and looking at the bumblebee with the bumblebees, they're just little fuzzy butts sticking out of the flowers, you know, and they're just, it looks like this ecstatic embrace. This, this creature was made for this thing. And how can you not feel that joy? It's, it, it, that is the, you know, the little things are still beautiful, even when the big thing is, can be overwhelming. That's, that's how I think of it, I think. I mean, you could choose to say, look at this experience of nature that I can still have, and maybe there are these, these tiny gardens around, you know, around the, the neighborhoods and the states. 
Or you could say, and you choose not to do this, but you could say, this is, a, this is so precious because it is diminishing and we're losing that. The thing though about um, looking around nearby nature, which is very different I think from hiking the Appalachian Trail. Mm. Um, wilderness, I don't, I don't um, have access to wilderness. I have access to a half acre backyard and, or the whole yard is half an acre total. And what, I, what, what it seems so clear to me is that in, when nearby nature has the chance to recover, mm -hmm. it does, right before your very eyes. You plant milkweed, the monarchs come. You plant um, any kind of native wildflower and the bees, every kind of bee comes. You stop spraying, or we never sprayed, but you don't, you don't use poison on your yard and you welcome the moles. Like, I really love my moles because... <laughs> You're laughing, but it's true. The moles are like my partners, my gardening partners, because they, when they're building a new tunnel, I say they, moles are solitary creatures and no one mole, no more than one mole has, will be in a tunnel, but there'll be overlapping tunnels. Yeah, I didn't know that. And uh, they're mean, even to each other. <laughs> but they, um, when they're making a new tunnel, when the babies are dispersing in the, in the summer, they push that soil up and so they're doing good work for for homeowners because they're eating the grubs that would be eating the tree roots but they're also leaving little piles of loose soil all over the yard and you don't have to do anything you just have to leave them and then you know go out and there'll be all of a sudden this whole stand of butterweed that wasn't there the year before or a whole stand of snake root or Carolina elephant's foot, it's all there and I didn't plant it and I didn't cultivate it. All I did was let it happen and when you see that over and over and over again that you go to pick up your rental car in kind of a scuzzy part of town and where they don't spray the edges of the parking lots and you're realizing, oh, look at all those all that daisy flea bane and it's right. covered with bees. When you have that opportunity to make a tiny little bit of difference and you see that difference happen, mm -hmm. it's very encouraging. It's self-fulfilling. As soon as it happens, you start looking around for other ways to do that because it makes you feel so happy. Uh, the poet Ross Gay was here sitting in that chair last year and you know he is well known for the practice of joy and yes. delight and when we talked about I thought about this as I read your book when we talked about joy he said what what at first blush sounds really weird but makes a lot of sense it was something like this people think joy just comes easily but joy is so luminous because it must be paired with the knowledge that we are dying. Do you hear the murmur out that? Yeah. Every minute of every day. And he makes that sound so euphoric and wonderful. You get that. I do get that. What, what do you get about that? It's kind of like the way people say, if we didn't have four seasons, we wouldn't appreciate springtime or we wouldn't appreciate summer that part of what we love about something is that it is ephemeral we ourselves are ephemeral mm -hmm. everything is um even the even the smoky mountains even the rockies they're crumbling to dust right. over a time frame that we won't experience personally but it is everything is temporary and something about that temporariness makes the beauty and the joy and the love feel more precious mm -hmm. than it would be if you thought you would live forever and your relationships would never be troubled and you, the flowers would always be blooming and the bees would always be there. I mean, this brings us back to rejoicing and grieving, right, simultaneously. So much 
so many people just don't care. They they don't care. They they haven't observed any change in their own personal lives. They never paid attention to the birds or the bees, and so they don't notice that there are fewer of them. But for the people who care and who are noticing, it is very easy for the grief to take over. Mm -hmm. It's very easy for the balance to shift wholly to that side. That's right. And yet, think about what a waste it would be if we did that. If If it's true, if it's true that we're going to lose all the songbirds, at least the migratory ones, we'll never be able to compensate for the fact that their food sources and their migratory patterns are out of sync. If that's true, how much more we are obliged to notice and treasure them while we have them. What a waste it would be to lose those last days or months or years to despair that won't accomplish anything. See, I think the idea of despair is what stops people from getting along that arc of recognition of, oh, these songbirds are beautiful. They're diminishing. Someday they won't be there. Now, what, what's my role in that? And what can I do? And I think that's kind of where the, you know, where it ends for a lot of people. Well, there's nothing I can do. Well, and that's exactly right. I agree with you completely. And I think part of the problem is journalism. I mean, I think we, you do and me, tell. Yes. We, we have for so long, you know, in the, when I was in college in the, in the early 80s, it did seem for a moment there Like, we were aware. The term carrying capacity was not an exotic idea in the early 80s. And then the fossil fuel companies, the PR departments got hold of that, and they just started downplaying the whole thing. And and even now, they're the ones that are really promulgating that idea, that this, this idea of a personal carbon footprint, that we are personally responsible. And to feel personally responsible and simultaneously powerless is mm-hmm. a recipe for despair. Mm-hmm. And I think that most, for years, journalists thought our job was to wake people up. That's right. Raise this the is, alarm on This it. is so bad. You don't even, you're not even noticing we're, we're everything, the, pol- the polar bears are gone. You know, this is so bad and and it doesn't work as a as a method for activating change it it merely fosters despair so if you want to get past despair you have to believe that you aren't powerless or at least you have to believe at the very least you have to believe that despair will do nothing it will improve nothing that we don't have time for this nonsense called despair. And <clears throat> one of the reasons I think about that is I think about interviewing John Lewis mm-hmm. the um, days after the 2016 election, and I humiliated myself by bursting into tears before I could ever get a question out of my mouth. Really? I felt so stupid, just weeping. What, what happened? despair happened. (laughs) Donald Trump got elected president. (laughs) And I just lost it. I'm looking at this icon, this patron saint for my entire life, sitting there impassively and patting me. Mm. You know, how did it be? How did I let it happen that his job was to comfort me? But his answer to my despair was, Change never happens in a linear fashion. It's always two steps forward, one step back. There are always forces working against us when we're trying to change things for the better, but we can outlast them. And, you know, we do have a ticking clock on this climate and um, extinction crisis, but um, even recognizing that there are things we cannot at this point change doesn't mean we can't change things. I think it's also believing in the power of the collective, not to sound like- That is so true. But isn't that- Yep. 
but a lot of people don't. Or there the are a lot of, go ahead. I think we have to ask ourselves this question. When someone is telling us it's pointless, someone is telling us that we've wasted our time, my question is, who's making money off that idea? Who's making money making us feel terrible? Who's making money? Someone is. Several someones are. The social media people are. The media people are. The fossil fuel people are. A lot of people have real economic investment in our being convinced that there's nothing we can do. Oh, we don't even get me started on the politicians in my state, for example. <laughs> it's there, and, and so there's just enough about me that is just de cussedly determined <laughs> not to let them win. Uh -huh. You know, and I think that it is true. <laughs> but it is true that if, I'll tell you, do we have time for just a little bitty story? Absolutely. The okay. stage is yours. So y'all probably don't get Tennessee news up here in Minnesota, but... Um, oh, we see plenty of Tennessee news here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Probably makes you feel pretty good about Minnesota, doesn't it? <laughs> there is no sense of superiority, Margaret. <laughs> no. Well, it would be warranted. We have our totally. own problems. Yeah. Mm. But uh, the in, in last year, 2022, in... in the early, in the early part of the year, the Tennessee governor, Bill Lee, delivered his state of the state address. And his, uh, as part of his, you know, whole laundry list of things he planned to accomplish, which he was probably gonna get all of them because he has a supermajority of Republicans in the state house, he announced that he had invited um, an incredibly conservative, and I don't even know if the word conservative is appropriate, an incredibly reactionary, anti, ahistorical uh, college to create a, uh, 50 charter schools in the state of Tennessee. Wow. That would follow a curriculum designed to produce, and I am not even joking, patriots, <laughs> not citizens. And the state legislature, the, the, the House, the Senate, they were all there, they stood up, they applauded, it was like, hooray! Let's privatize the education in the state of Tennessee. And then about five months later, there was a big fundraiser, and the president of the college that was gonna create this program of charter schools came to a fundraiser dinner and he spoke publicly, and uh, there was a secret reporter in there recording the remarks and they were extremely disparaging of public school teachers. They, he said that the dumbest department in any university was the teacher education program. Wow. He said that it doesn't take any education or training to be a teacher. Anybody can be a teacher because it's, no hard, it's nothing hard to do about that. And let me tell you what, the teachers of Tennessee lost their minds. <laughs> and. Tennessee teachers are not, by and large, unionized. They are not, by and large, uh, liberal or progressive. But they, they made phone calls. They wrote letters. The, their state representatives, their state senators were backpedaling as fast as they possibly could. They were saying there's no way these... When people make it impossible for politicians to ignore them, they will pay attention. It is possible to change even the most hardened ideologue if it's in that ideologue's self-interest to do so. So I think that we can change everything about how we do our yards. We can change everything about uh, how we manage right now things that are considered controversial. And con you know, in the state of Tennessee, people did not want to lose abortion rights. In the state of Tennessee, people did not want LGBTQ citizens to be persecuted. They, didn't, they, don't, they just aren't voting that way yet. But the polls all show that everybody in Tennessee, 87% of people in Tennessee believe that climate change is happening and that we did it. Mm -hmm. So collect, the collective is the only answer. Except that 
it seems like it has to get to the extreme, uh, there's no way out, there's no way forward unless we stop this point. And we could go down a lot of, yeah. a lot of lists of issues like that, but I'll bring that back to climate change. I mean, I, I heard climate scientists on the radio yesterday saying, if we could only keep it to 1.6 or 1.7 degrees of an increase, if we can just, and I just thought that, you know what my, my immediate thought was? That won't be enough to scare enough people to really change. And I'm not putting that all back on individuals. I believe in the power of yeah. the collective. But where's that agency too? I think the problem with 1.5 or 1.6 or 1.7 is that that kind of talk sounds to a lot of people like a math problem. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't sound like something that has anything to do with them. And honestly, it's pure hubris to think that it might do that, but that was all I had when I started writing The Comfort of Crows. That's what I thought I had. Is like, let's, if I could find a way to make it personal to, to people, so it doesn't seem like a math problem. So it seems like we're losing our neighbors. We're losing our, their, our world. Mm -hmm. Maybe they would do something, but I don't think those numbers do anything. People are just trying to get their lunch boxes packed and they're trying to get the coats on the toddler who doesn't want to put a coat on. And, and they're just trying to get through the day. They can't, they can't like mentally think, okay, what is 1.5 center? What is that even in Fahrenheit? And, and what does that mean in terms of flooding or drought or heat? It has to be visceral to us. You know, we are not really as logical as we think we are. Everything still happens yeah, here, right. I think. When I hear you say people are just trying to fill in the blank, sometimes I think that's kind of a cop-out. How give, so? Because I give voters more credit and give individuals more credit than I can worry about the grades my kids are getting in school, mm -hmm. and I can worry about the fact that Margaret Rankle, my neighbor, had to create a pollinator garden because we're losing the pollinators. I, I, I think that lets people off the hook. I wonder what you think of that. Probably it does, some people. Let's not let them off the hook. But it's I think dire. It is dire, and I, and I struggle with this so much. Like the desire to grab people yes, by the neck. absolutely. You know, <laughs> it's so hard to just sit on my hands, yeah. but it's... Um, Say more about that. <laughs> okay, so when you write for a newspaper in the opinion department, you have to be sparing, I think, with rage. Ah, because interesting. <laughs> I just feel like rage is, it, it's really very effective on occasion and very off-putting on a regular basis. That's me. Uh, maybe other people love the shock. No, uh, I think that's right. You become desensitized. Right. It, right. It, it, if, if this, if everything is an emergency, then there is no emergency. Right. Um, so part of like trying to dial that back is just pragmatic. And, and part of it is just, how many people do you know who changed their mind about something because you yelled at them? Right, yeah. Like if you've Nobody. ever ever been in a marriage. My husband, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, exactly, <laughs> thinking the same thing. <laughs> right. Children, you yell at children and they just, they just cry. <laughs> you know, they don't change. <laughs> right. Right. So I do think as a, as a tool for persuasion, rage is very limited. But I also think that it's sometimes absolutely important. To, it's crucial. You can't just pretend that it isn't an emergency when it is an emergency. So finding that balance is, a, the, you know, I think it's the great challenge we all have.
Tell me how, how and when you decide to deploy your rage. You're going to tell me I'm letting these people off the hook, too, I think. But I make a distinction between voters who are just trying to get the lunchboxes packed okay. and the people they vote for. Ah. And a lot of people don't make that distinction. And in fact, they yell at me a lot, which is how I know that yelling doesn't change anybody's mind. <laughs> but it's one of the ways. But, you know, it, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to explain it, but I think that I, I feel perfectly free reign to rage at the Tennessee General Assembly without simultaneously raging at my Republican neighbors. Mm -hmm. um, because... It's because you don't know the assembly no, individually. No, I do know them, actually. Individually, though? Unfortunately. Yeah? I, it's, I don't even know how to explain it, except that I don't think that most people have... Un, have come to accept that they are being lied to by their elected officials. It's new enough as a phenomenon that we were, when I was growing up watching the news, you know, everybody knew what was happening in Vietnam. Everybody knew what was happening in Watergate because all the news networks were reporting essentially the same facts. And the politicians, if they got caught in a lie, they were ashamed, or at least they made, they, they tried to appear to be ashamed. Now it's just so brazen, the lies. We, we just don't know as a culture how to deal with the fact that our leaders are lying to us, our media outlets are lying to us. Lots and lots of people no longer know how to distinguish the truth from a lie. <laughs> and so if they're being lied to and they believe the lie, I give them a little grace. Two things about that. I'm thinking, how did we get from joy and delight to everybody's lying here? Uh, somehow this Come interview has gone Nashville off the off and I'll rails. show you how we got there. Okay, here's the, here's the other thing. I do think people know that their politicians lie to them and that's why the cynicism runs so deep and that's why the expectations are so low. What do you think of that? Christianity is a lot of the problem here. Really? In, in the South. Because a fundamental tenet of evangelical Christianity is, um, is confession and forgiveness. Uh -huh. So I was talking to this, in 2016, I was talking to this woman who cuts my hair, and she's very country, and she's very... Um, she has deep, heartfelt beliefs. And I said to her, Tanya, everything he does violates everything you stand for. Every principle you hold dear, he stomps on it and buries it in the mud. And she said, if I didn't believe in forgiveness, I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. And I think he's changed. And that line is deployed in so many contexts. The belief, the recognition that we are all, that we all fall short of our own ideals, that we make terrible mistakes, and that a loving God will forgive us if we repent. It's it's hard for the people who believe that, it's hard for them to condemn somebody who tells them they're, they've reformed. What I hear in that is you trying to apply logic to something that is deeply emotional and in some ways cynical, although she, that's probably not how she, Tenya would describe herself. Oh, totally but, not cynical. But, but there is a cynicism to that. Her, her expectations are 
are low and you're running down kind of the list of principles that you see what I'm saying? This is so emotional that it. Well, I agree with you that political identity is a complex thing. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you're right that one of the reasons they believe that somebody has reformed or they believe the lies is because they want to believe them. Mm -hmm. I don't call that cynicism, though. It, for me, it's mo much more like um, a kind of, th these are my people, this is my home. I don't know how to be outside that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I do know so many people who crossed the aisle in 2020, who voted for Joe Biden, who didn't vote for Donald Trump. I know them personally. They weren't putting signs in their yard. They weren't posted on Twitter. They didn't bring it up at Thanksgiving. It was this secret thing in their hearts. And it was enough of those people to, to mm -hmm. change the way things turned out. And, and I think that, but that takes so much courage to do that, to say, I'm gonna hear this and, and I'm gonna follow it to the truth when it's gonna separate me from my church, it's gonna separate me from my family, it's gonna separate me from my neighbors, it's gonna separate me from my friends. I mean, this is this, you write about kinship. This is, this is what you're describing. And Who will I be if I am not among my right. kin? Right? And it's really hard. People forget how hard that is because they just think, well, it's so stupid. Why wouldn't you see the light? And political identity just doesn't work that way. And I think it's exactly what you said. It's a, it's a much more atavistic, emotional thing than it is a logical thing. But that is why I draw a line between the people and the elected <laughs> officials. I'll go hard on the elected officials. But I, I do want to try to acknowledge the complexity of political identity. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I guess, and, and I'm, not, I'm not here saying, no, every, every individual voter needs to be held responsible. That would be ridiculous. But this, I mean, what's broken, right, is this sense of kind of what you've just described, seeing past seeing, wanting to see that there is a kinship in a community that's made up of people who think differently and have different life experiences and being very comfortable retreating back into that, you know, that identity, that tribe, for lack of a better word. It's harder though when you live in a place like Tennessee. Yeah, absolutely. There are no bubbles. You know, everybody's family is mixed. Everybody's neighborhood is mixed. Mm -hmm. um, some, sometimes the solution is not to talk about it. Sometimes the solution is to talk about it and try really hard not to yell. Um, not to deploy the rage. Right. 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 Um, it, but there is, you do, what good would it do? I mean, there's so many people who are saying, well, you know, liberals in the South, why don't you just leave? Why don't we just go ahead and let them go? Let the red states go. We'll have two countries. They'll starve to death. We'll be fine. And it's... I read that stuff and just think... What world what? do you live in? I know. You hear a lot of that there? Oh, so much. Not from my... No, I'm talking about on social media. Okay. Now that I'm off Twitter, I'm so much happier. <laughs> and... Um, but that's, that, that is the position people from outside the South often take towards Southerners. It's like, if you're the enlightened one, then you're just gonna have to get out of there. But I like John Lewis's way better. I like staying and fighting, because I'll be damned if I'm gonna let them win. <laughs> that is not their country, this is my country. All right. You know, I, I wanted to ask you about your view of what kinship is in, in the kind of culture that we're living in, because I don't think of it as polite or prim. I think of it as hard, and, and I think we've, we've seen that. I think of it as something that you have to recommit to constantly. What, what's your view of it? 
I agree with you 100%. I think that's exactly it. I mean, look, we're not, we don't have any fangs. We have no fur. We have no claws. We only survive by cooperation. Right. That as a species, we are pitiful. <laughs> you know, the only way we survive is by casting our lot with one another. But some of those people are assholes. And so, we'll be editing that little morsel sorry, out. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter. They, they, we, we have to find common ground with them. We have to, and, and we didn't for a long, long time. But we now, we now have no choice because the time is running out. Um, so I do think that that's part of kinship is recognizing our need for one another. But, but a lot of what I think of as kinship is is just sort of finding a way to stop thinking of ourselves as not part of the natural world. Hmm. Like we, mm -hmm. are, we are also creatures. We are also animals. We also depend upon our ecosystems in every fundamental way there is. And so we have to learn to think of our wild neighbors as essential, just as essential as we are, because they are part of the ecosystem that sustains us, and we are part of the ecosystem that sustains them. And that kinship is utterly essential, or we will get nowhere. How about the first excerpt? This seems like a good place for that. Okay. Many of these essays in The Comfort of Crows begin with an, uh, an epigraph. Uh, this one, this essay is called Wild Joy. And the epigraph is from E.B. White's One Man's Meat. Notes on springtime and on anything else that comes to mind of an intoxicating nature. <laughs> March comes in like a lion, except when it comes in like a lamb or when it comes in like a chorus, a symphony, and an exquisitely choreographed ballet all at once. A performance so breathtaking it could not possibly be replicated. It is replicated anyway, one day after another. Cue the waking insects stirring in the leaf litter. Cue the flashing bluebirds swooping from the bare maple branches to reap the insects stirring in the leaf litter. Cue the fox and his magnificent coat shining in the moonlight, his ears pricked, his tail curled around his beautiful fox feet. Cue the hard brown buds waiting, waiting all through winter but just beginning to quiver any day now, any day, they will warm into blossom. I treasure every iridescent green bee waking to feed on the first vanishing bloodroot flower, the first ephemeral spring beauty, the first woodland violet and cut leaf toothwort. Soon, there will be trilliums and trout lilies, too. Any day now, toad shade trilliums and trout lilies. If you tell me I don't deserve this joy, you are telling me nothing I don't already know. From the very first hominid to rise up on bare feet and stumble across a field of blooming grass, we have been burning this world down. I know that. I am in love with the mild light of the coming springtime anyway, with the shivering joy of the coming springtime, with all the beguiling creatures of the coming springtime. Come to the woods and stand with me in the sunshine beneath the trees. 
Watch the bluebirds diving for insects. Watch them peeking into the nest holes the woodpeckers carved out years ago. Listen to the cry of the woodpeckers in the echoing woods. Let it lift your heart. Let it still your busy hands and feet. And let it still your worried mind. Listen with everything you are. With all you are, listen for the hum and flutter of the waking world. The upland chorus frogs are singing. It is a song of full-throated promise. It's beginning again. It's all beginning again. It's true that most of what is greening up in these woods right now isn't native to the American South. March is a stark reminder of how thoroughly plants imported from Europe and Asia have escaped their gardens and taken over the surrounding fields and forests. Sap is rising in the canes of Japanese honeysuckle, and sap is rising in the branches of the Bradford pear trees. While our native maples and oaks are still sleeping, and the poison ivy that coils around them too, the invasive vinca vines in the understory are waking up into greenness. I can hardly help from greeting them with joy. I refuse to quell this joy. It's possible to understand what invasive species are doing to the woods and still feel the leaping heart of joy in the presence of greenness. It's entirely possible to exult in birdsong and miniature flowers peeking out from the dead leaves of autumn. In this troubled world, it would be a crime to snuff out any flicker of happiness that somehow flames up into life. We are creatures built for joy. At the very saddest funerals, we can hear a funny story about our lost beloved, and God help us, we laugh. We can stagger out of an appointment where a person in a white coat has given us the news we think we cannot bear to hear, and still we smile at the baby in the checkout line, clapping her chubby hands at the balloons by the cash register, or kicking her feet in pleasure at the sight of a stranger's smile. This is who we are, the very best of who we are. The world is burning and there is no time to put down the water buckets. For just an hour, put down the water buckets anyway. Take your cue from the bluebirds who have no faith in the future but who build the future nevertheless, leaf by leaf and straw by straw, shaping them into the roundness of the world. Turn your face up to the sky. Listen, the world is trembling into possibility. The world is reminding us that this is what the world does best, new life rebirth, the greenness that rises out of ashes. It's a long, long road travel driving across the plain I keep my eyes looking forward to the place that calls my name the day keeps drawing nearer till I see your rugged face 
My long lost days are over And I'm making to hold you near Someday soon, someday soon My heart will be with you Someday soon, someday soon Can hold you dear someday soon, someday soon. I'll wipe my safe clean someday soon, someday soon. My heart will be with you, be with you. The Dollies. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Carrie Miller. You're listening to Talking Volumes from the Fitzgerald Theater. Writer and columnist Margaret Rankle is here, and her new book is titled The Comfort of Crows, A Backyard Year. You know, listening to you read that essay, I had this, <laughs> this sense of this is the gospel according to Margaret. There was... Do you understand why I'm saying that? There, there was this kind of, um, and this is the word, <laughs> and this is how it is, sensibility to it. Did you feel that way when you were reading in the book or only because I was declaiming? It was, you were declaiming, yeah, because of that. Um, you, you say at one point uh, in one of your essays to yourself, stop it, nature is not a sermon. What does that mean? I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm, I've been reconsidering my understanding of anthropomorphism yeah. lately. You know, because you're, we're, we're we were taught in school that it's, um, it, it's an injustice to other creatures to assume that they experience the same motivations and the same emotions that we do. And I'm not sure that's true anymore. But when I wrote that, what you just read, mm -hmm. I, w I was still trying to think like that. Like that the point of the natural world is not to give me lessons. It's not to make me learn something. It's not to teach me. Mm. The, 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 the natural world is entirely indifferent to me in most ways. I mean, they, they're aware of our comings and goings. They know when it's safe. Uh, the animals of of nearby nature are always paying attention to us. They're always studying our patterns. You watch when the time changes, there'll be a lot more dead animals on the side of the road because they figured out our traffic patterns. They, 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 they thought they knew when it was safe to cross the road. And then we change the time and mess up the traffic patterns. They are studying us, but they aren't, they aren't, their, their role in the world is not to teach me anything. Mm -hmm. But the, speaking of kinship, the more I watch and listen 
the more I think that they really are more like us than not. And they're very, we, we like to pretend that we aren't animals. We like to pretend that we're making all good, all good decisions. None of them are motivated by hormones. None of them are motivated by self-interest. But that's not really true, is it? And why should we think that animals would be any different? I know from watching the creatures in my yard that some squirrels are smarter than other squirrels. <laughs> like they can figure out, there's always one squirrel that figures out how to get into that squirrel-proof bird feeder. <laughs> I had one one year that it was a squirrel-proof finch feeder and you know, the finches uh, have little conical beaks and the, the entry points for a bird eating thistle seed in a, in a, in a finch feeder are too, too, too small for other birds and, and, and too small for a squirrel. But this one squirrel got the, the, the perches of that feeder, pulled it up to his mouth, and then systematically <laughs> licked out those seeds <laughs> one at a time. Oh like he had figured oh. out. And, and I know that one broadhead skink trusts me and the other one does not. Like the male doesn't, but the female knows I'm not going to cause her any. They are different from one another. Yeah. They operate according to different motivations from each other and from us. And to me, that's just not that different from how we act. Probably to them, we all look at the same, but we are different. Right? Yeah. What, so what conclusion have you come to about anthropomorphizing? I mean, have you, have you figured out how to, how to work in your new uh, perceptions about that? I don't know if this is growing older, but I, lately I've sort of started to think that when people accuse me of anthropomorphizing, it's because they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Like they've, they've never sat and watched a bird build a nest. They've never watched two nestlings getting ready to leave the nest and seen how different one is from the other. Mm -hmm. How one mm -hmm. just flings mm -hmm. itself out of the nest and the yeah. other's like, oh, I don't know about this. <laughs> I mean, every creature out there is different from others within its same species. And to say that is often the basis of an accusation for anthropomorphizing, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think I'm right. <laughs> so you've gotten better. Really, the conclusion you've drawn is, I'm going to ignore the fools that don't know what they're talking about. That's or tell them that's what we've fools. come to. Or yeah. tell them that they're fools. Um, yeah. We've, I think we've kind of glanced off faith and religion a little bit in the conversation, but um, you grew up Catholic. You have left a traditional church practice. Is that, is that right? Yes. Or have you gone back? Nope. Not going back. Not going back. Why are you so sure of that? It took me a long time to get to this point. I mean, I didn't do what most people do when they leave Catholicism. I didn't grow up and just not go back. Mm-hmm. I raised three children in the church. I married in the church. I buried four parents in the church. Um, the whole time I knew that the church was never going to ordain women in my lifetime. The whole time I knew that a lot of what contributions from parishioners went to were things I didn't agree with, I fundamentally, passionately disagreed with. And what the church gave me was enough to overcome that. And then Catholics helped to elect Donald Trump. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't know if it was the camel that broke the, cam the, 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 straw. the straw that broke the camel's back, or if it was like, <sighs> I, I didn't need what it offered at that time, and I don't still. You, you wrote in 2018 in a column, 
For me, a church can't summon half the awe and gratitude inspired by a full-throated forest in all its indifferent splendor. In that column, you had decided to go back to church on Easter Sunday. I did, and I did go back that Sunday. And something had changed. I, don't, I think it had changed in me, obviously. So you'd been away... You were drawn back on that Easter Sunday. There are, it's wrong to say that I, it doesn't give me what I miss. I still miss the singing. You know, I still miss the handshake of peace. Mm -hmm. But I never did believe that that was the sole repository of truth. I just thought it was one manifestation of truth. I always believed that. And so it was... It was, you know, a tentative return only to feel a little bit alienated when I got there. I, maybe I had just lost the knack of being Catholic. I don't know. It's a big decision to say these people I've known and who know me right. are no longer my kin in some But I ways. didn't say that. I, that isn't what I said. What did you say? The formality of it what, was not what I wanted anymore. I wanted the forest instead. So... But that doesn't mean I don't still love those people, that I don't still want to be with them. The, you know, Are you with them? Well, the... I continued to volunteer for a, a homeless rescue organization f until I went on book tour for Leap Migrations, that, and the pandemic kind of ended that whole thing. So yeah, I was still in touch with them, still felt as close to them as I ever had. That's a pretty um, circumstantial way to know someone. It, it isn't like, for example, in my neighborhood, Mm -hmm. The neighborhood we've lived in for 28 years raised our three children, and that group of people is as politically diverse as, it, as any group of people can be. But that is a very foundational connection that was different from seeing the same people in church once a week. Mm -hmm. These are people, you know, who got in their cars and drove three hours south from, for my mother's funeral. These are people you know, who sat together in the pew when one of them lost a 16-year-old child. These are people who have been together through miscarriages and divorces, and that connection has nothing to do with politics. So it sounds like you miss, or, or you don't miss, the ritual, the... No, I the don't. The sharing of... No? Mm -mm. Wow. You say that so... I'm not saying I won't ever Certainly. decide that I miss it, but I don't miss it right now. I really don't miss it. I, I actually, I, I credit a lot of things to menopause. <laughs> <laughs> That's not where I thought this was going. <laughs> I mean, I really, I, I, speaking of hormonal motivations, you know, that, <laughs> that, reduction in oxytocin hit me in a really profound way because it meant that as somebody who wanted to go along to get along and who wanted to um, make peace, I just felt less of an impulse to do that. <laughs> Um, but, but in truth, you know, I feel less of that, you know, they, they call that the tend and befriend hormone mm -hmm. as opposed to the fight or flight hormone. And, and I think it's a, it, I think it's a true thing. I don't, I don't mind when I make people mad anymore. I don't um, feel the need to smooth over a disagreement. I don't care about the mean comments. Like truly, I don't care. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. You have been freed. I am free. That's either menopause or... Jesus. <laughs> Would we be able to see that change when it was happening in your writing? Maybe. I, I think at one point I just said, I'm not going to write about this anymore. When, when, I've, when 
when the editor, an editor called and offered me the chance to write weekly for the Times, he named some stuff that they were happy I did. And one of them was that I was, I was willing to write about my faith. And at some point, I stopped being willing to do that. Hmm. And I don't, I can't really nail when it was, but um, it, it, I couldn't see the value in it. I couldn't really? see that it had made any difference at all, and it opened me up to a lot of hurt. From externally? Mm -hmm. The things people would say. I think it's so valuable that you wrote about your faith. I still write about it in a more of a sociological sense than a personal sense. I am a personal essayist. It's, it's, there's very, there are very few topics that I find... I, I don't somehow enter through a story mm -hmm. or a personal experience of some kind, but um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I haven't really parsed it. Do you miss writing about it? Well, I have to say it was never my favorite thing to write about. It's, there is a certain self-protection that comes from being a writer in a public form of any kind, whatever it is, local newspaper, um, books, you know, it doesn't matter. You, to, to publish something is to invite someone else's opinion. Mm -hmm. And I guess at some point you start, um, or I did, I started doing a little bit of calculation, like how much of it is worth the aggravation huh. that is going to come my way if I do this? And in some cases, the, the calculation was very much, okay, well, I don't especially like writing about politics, but I am going to. That's a, a moral obligation I feel I have. I mean, talk about inviting reaction, exactly. right? Exactly, but that's a, I don't know why, but writing about something as intensely personal as a relationship with the divine is different than saying, than trying to call out injustice when you see it. I don't know how to explain that difference, but it feels very different to me. What, what I wondered about that was whether you were reaching people who might read your columns about politics who, you know, very easy for them to say, well, I don't know where she comes by that and I'm not gonna read that. But it was, it's harder to do that when you're writing so personally about your faith. I think even the thing about faith, especially, well, I, I guess I can't make a universal statement about it, but to me, it's everywhere. Like it's all over this book. It's just not, I don't call it by it that is. name. So if you are a person of faith, you see it. And if you aren't, you don't. And that's a very pleasant place to be as a writer. <laughs> I think, you know, I think it's funny because I've done several interviews now around the publication of this book, which has only been out a week. But, you know, sometimes they do the podcast early, start mm. talking about it early. And it's amazing to me how the questions are so often, you can tell, you can know something about the questioner by the questions. Because... The ones who are looking for hope find hope. And the ones who are looking for an art articulation of despair find despair. And the ones who are looking for an integration of faith and ordinary life find that too. I don't know. I, I, I guess it's proof that reading, that writers and readers really are in a community. Mm -hmm. And what someone reads is as much about what they bring to the reading as what the writer brought to the write, writing, I think. What a great segue to talk about book banning. Because <laughs> we, I want to talk about book banning sure. here. I like talking about that. Um, so what was, the, what was the reaction like with the column on book banning, the recent one? Is that one of those where you get the wave of? No, and it's, it's surprisingly not. Wow. And I have started to figure out that when they know they're wrong, 
they keep quiet. <laughs> they hope it'll just disappear. But it's not just, you know, there are plenty of people and they're all over, you know, the comment section, they're all over social media. There are plenty of people for whom somebody will stand up there and read the most potentially explosive three sentences in an entire book and they'll say, this is what, this is what these people want. It's pornography. And, but, but so much of the question of book banning is just about persecuting librarians, mm -hmm. teachers. It's, it's, the political motivation is so transparent. Right on. But, and everyone sees it. Every, everybody is absolutely clear on that, both sides of the aisle. Meanwhile, there's this, in Tennessee, we have a law that, a brand new law that um, there's a new committee appointed by the state to evaluate the safety of every text that every school child in the state of Tennessee comes into contact with. So you think about all these Title I schools where the only books these children have access to are classroom collections. If they're gonna read more than a story in a textbook, if they're gonna read a, a, a novel for an eight-year-old, if they're gonna read something by Kate D. Camillo, it's gonna be because a teacher has provided it. Mm -hmm. And now the, the rule is that the teachers have to take a picture of the title page of every book in their classroom collection. I mean, how smart is it to go to war with third grade teachers? <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. You wrote, um, I love the way you closed that column. A book reminds us that we are not alone, that our own lives, which too often feel small and insignificant, are part of a story that can be terrible and full of pain, but also astonishing and often magnificent. Children instinctively understand that truth about the books they read, whether their parents want them to or not. There was a lot of writing about book banning this earlier in October, but boy, this one really grabbed my heart on it. Have you been waiting to say a lot of these things, or how did you? You're a reader, so that's probably a conclusion you came to yourself as an eight-year-old. The children, we, we, the books tell the truth. That that yeah. this is why they last. Yeah, is that they tell us something about ourselves or about the world we find ourselves in, and. Parents might like to pretend that they have some control over that. Even before, you know, people were giving eight-year-olds cell phones. You know, even before then, children know what's happening. Children understand that the world is more complex than is comfortable. Children are really, they know that it's a, they're little and the world is big. They know that. It's not a secret. So... There's so much about these book bans. The, the, there's like two categories of the, the most egregious book banning. One has to do with anything having to do the L, with the LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. I, with, that, with that identity, any, any aspect of that identity terrifies parents, some parents, because they think it's a choice. They think it's contagious. They think that, uh, that if they keep the idea that these these ways of being in the world are an option, then they will keep their children from close. choosing it. Yes. And, and of course, that's crazy. It's not how childhood works. P parents have never, ever been able to do that for their children. They have never been able, like you think when you're, a, you're about to have your first baby, oh, I'm just gonna make this child perfect. <laughs> I am never gonna mess up. I'm gonna do everything right. I'm gonna make sure they, I'm gonna, it, this is a little ball of clay <laughs> that I am gonna shape. And there is no baby in the world that comes in here a little ball of clay. <laughs> like they come with opinions and proclivities and they come with their own selves fully formed. And so the idea that you can say, I'm not going to, my kid's not going to be gay, even though I really kind of secretly suspect that child is gay, <clears throat> just by keeping the books away from them, that's, that's nuts. But um, they, that's what they think. The other one, 
as insidious as that is, the other aspect of the most common book bans um, have to do with suppressing history, and that is in some ways far worse. Mm -hmm. Because, like in in Florida, uh, you know, they have a textbook that's saying that enslaved people learned um, handy skills yes. um, from enslavement and things like that. And and their argument is that it's not. It's, uh, it's making my child uncomfortable. It's making my black child feel inferior. It's making my white child feel guilty. And, um, but that isn't really how children react. You know, like you read a story, one of the stories that got banned in, in Tennessee was um, a little early reader about uh, Ruby Bridges, the little girl in Arkansas who integrated her her public school. And in the pictures, there are these white people, uh, marshals are walking Ruby to school. And in the pictures, there are these really angry faces, you know, and, and these moms for liberty were saying, oh, I don't want, I don't want my children's coming home ashamed of being white. And it's like, well, but there's another white character in that story. And that's the school teacher who taught Ruby alone all school year because all the other parents had pulled their children out of school. That white character is a hero. The other white characters are despicable. And why do you think your child is responding to this <laughs> one side of yeah. the story, but not to the other side of the story? So there's definitely something else going on there. And it's very transparent what it is. Nobody cares anything about books who's banning books. They're just getting people mad, so they'll go to the polls now that they don't have to go to the polls to get abortion canceled as an option. This is what I've wondered is, are these, we could go on and on here. I just looked at the time. I'm like, um, are these people that really care about books, or is this just political, cynical convenience? And yet the people that are going to lose out are the librarians, the, the teachers, the students. What, what's, your, what's your thought on that? I think there, it is a vanishingly small number of people making a very loud noise. Who I, don't care all that much about books themselves. Oh, I don't think they've ever read a book. <laughs> I mean, it's, that sounds... That sounds like a, a joke line, but it's true. There are people objecting to the presence of books in their school, child's school library, or not even their child's, like their community's school library. They don't even have children in that school. And they've not read the book, and they admit it. Right. It's just on a list. Yeah, it's total political motivation. It's just, you know, it's just part of our fury economy. Yeah. What's the book that was that you remember as a child? It sounds like you read everything and anything. That's as true. As a kid, mm -hmm. yeah. What's the book that you first remember feeling seen by? Charlotte's Web. Oh. Yeah, why? Because that little girl could talk to the animals. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but sort of. She could sit and even though they were talking to one another and she couldn't understand, but she could sit and still understand, sort of. Great answer. Would you read the last essay? Mm -hmm. This is just part of one. This one also has an epigraph. The essay is called Autumn Light, and the epigraph is from Robin Wall Kimmerer and from Braiding Sweetgrass. I told him that I chose botany because I wanted to learn why asters and goldenrod look so beautiful together. Autumn light is the loveliest light there is. Soft, forgiving, it makes all the world a brightened dream. Dust motes catch fire, drifting down from the trees and rising from the stirred soil floating over lawns and woodland paths and ordinary roofs and parking lots. It's an unchoreographed aerial dance, 
a celebration of what happens when light marries earth and sky. Autumn light always makes me think of chalk dust settling in the expectant hush of an elementary school classroom during story time, just before the bell rings and sets the children free. In fall, the nights are cooler and clearer too, with the harvest moon floating steadfast in the night sky. Along the roadsides, in years when there's been enough rain, flowers bloom in wild bouquets, asters and ironweed and white snake root and goldenrod as high as my head. Food for the monarchs and the painted ladies and the ruby-throated hummingbirds as they make their long migrations. Every kind of New World warbler is on the wing now, heading south like the raptors and the waterbirds, but they linger a while before moving on again, and for a time, Tennessee is filled with exotic songs. The flowers that bloom in autumn, like the beauty berries and the hackberries and the arrowwood berries, don't deliberately signal the season of farewells. They are only blooming and ripening in their time, just as the birds and the butterflies are traveling in theirs. A perfect concatenation of abundance and need. But a lifetime of paying attention to to what feeds my winged neighbors means I can't help seeing these dust motes and these long shadows at the end of shortening days as an irrefutable sign. Summer is ending. By the time of the equinox, summer has already gone. There was a time when I didn't feel sad about the coming of fall perhaps because I grew up in Alabama where the new season mostly means the end of unrelenting heat and oppressive humidity. There are plenty of warm, sunny days in an Alabama winter, and camellias bloom in profusion from November until the first blossoms of springtime arrive. That's not true here in Tennessee where temperatures dip much lower at least once or twice each winter. But perhaps the reason I didn't feel sad about the onset of fall when I was younger is only that I was younger with my whole life still ahead. In those days, my only worry was that my real life, the one I would choose for myself and live on my own terms, was taking too long to arrive. Now I understand that every day I'm giving, given, is as real as life will ever get. Now I understand that we are guaranteed nothing, that our days have always been running out.
the Dollies. Thank you. You're listening to Talking Volumes at the Fitzgerald Theater with columnist and writer Margaret Rankel. Her new book is called The Comfort of Crows. We didn't even talk about crows. Somehow we got off on... But maybe somebody in the audience will ask a question sure. about that. Let's uh, bring the house lights up, and we have microphones. If you'd like to ask uh, Margaret a question, just raise your hand. I'll tell you, there's been a lot of questions at our other Talking Volumes events, so the pressure's on, people, to come up with some good ones. Ah, we have one right over there. Hi, thanks so much. Uh, in listening to your discussion about anthropomorphism, um, it, it dawned on me, uh, modern man is like two, 300,000 years old, whereas the bird that you were talking about that you people would ascribe human, human characteristics to were millions of years old, so it should really be the reverse. <laughs> I mean, you should be looking, wow, that child is just like that blue jay or that right. crow. <laughs> so that was all my comment. I, I really appreciate all that you've had to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, right over there in the, yep. Margaret, could you talk a little bit about your brother's art? In the book, it is so beautiful. And I'm curious, did you partner together on it or did one come? Did you write and he did art to correspond or what did that process look like? I'm so happy you asked that question. It's my very favorite thing to talk about. The whole time I was writing The Comfort of Crows, I was sometimes beset by uncertainty, like why would anybody care about my backyard? And then I would think, oh, but the art. The art will be worth it, just for the art. Um, my, my brother, is a, Billy Wrinkle, is a year younger than I am. And he and I have been collaborating our whole lives. He was, uh, his gift for art was clear from, from the, an, an absurdly early, early age, much earlier than any, uh, any idea I might have had about being a writer. And, and his whole aesthetic is very tuned to the same things that mine is. And he, he's a collage artist, so he collects paper, all kinds of things. What, for one of the pieces of art in, in um, The Comfort of Crows, he needed my wedding invitation from 35 years ago, which I cannot even put my hands on, but he knew right where it was. And so I didn't feel any sense that my input on the art was even needed. Like I, I, I think that in general, the relationship between text and image, there's always a, a very clear subservience of one over the other. Like a, a, it's an image with a caption and the words are subservient to the image or it's text with an illustration and the art is subservient to the text. But with Billy, I wanted to think of it as a kind of dialogue. And so I gave him the manuscript when it was still, when I was, I was my, my editor, Joey McGarvey, and I were still going back and forth on it. And we were moving things around and driving Billy absolutely wild because he would, he was trying to create a through line that followed his experiences of this seasons, but picked up on some of the imagery from the essays, but it's all his. It really is all his. Like this, this drawing that went, that goes with the essay that you just read is so ornate. I mean, what do you see when you see that? I wish you could see it in color, Carrie. Ah, yeah. It's so different in color because like that moon in the background right. is a, right. is Billy made that from a photograph that he then processed by way of a 19th century printing technique called cyanotypes. Wow. And so the cyanotypes are kind of a visual through line for all the artwork, but um, some of the pieces are much more ornate than others. Some are much simpler, but he was thinking, he was really, he would go back to, he's an art professor at a university in Tennessee, and he would go back and find an empty classroom and spread everything out after supper so he could see how it, un like he could make the art work, not just as 52 individual pieces. How it progressed yes. through the... The way the seasons also progress. Wow. 
Cool. My brother really is kind of a genius. <laughs> <laughs> he is. Uh, question right down there. I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell me if you have a relationship um, with another very famous woman from Tennessee who I think shares some of your political views. And of course, I'm talking about Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were talking about Ann Patchett, who was here, of course. Taylor, Taylor Swift went out on a great limb and supported a, the Democratic candidate for senator um, not in not not this most recent election, but the last one, and um, and that was you know she was spending some serious uh, capital to do that, but she is she, she is absolutely fearless. She and I think that must be part of why she's so beloved, is that young women aren't typically fearless. There's so many pressures that keep young women from speaking clearly and loudly and forcefully and not shutting up when someone tells them to shut up and sing. So the other great thing about Taylor Swift is that she's rich and <laughs> she gives away so much money. She gives away so much money that no one ever knows that she, cause she attaches the condition that the recipient of that money can't say where it came from. Wow. Massive amounts of money for good causes. And no, I don't know her. <laughs> you do but know Ann Patchett. I, I love Taylor Swift. Um, and I do know Ann Patchett, and I also love Ann Patchett. Um, yes. Question right up there. I wanted to piggyback on the first um, comments about anthropomorphic um, relationships between the blue jay and the child. Um, and if we look at some, uh, in so many indigenous cultures, really uh, it never occurs to them to make a differentiation. Right. So many of the clans will have um, just complete affiliation, whether it's the raven in the Pacific Northwest, and then individuals will have totems that they are given as children for exactly the reason that the man said they recognize that there are, there are similarities. So I think um, I just would invite all of us to look a little bit deeper into some of those wonderful cultures that have always had more affiliation with the natural world. Here, here. Uh, all right, question right over there. Hello, I'm a mother of grown children. And I, so I'm curious about your relationship with your children and how your very beautiful and organic way of seeing the world and life has influenced your children. And if you, I don't know, I, do, I don't want to say more, but just I'd be curious about that. I always say when I, when I get that question, they taught me a lot more than I taught them. Because that is, that is what children were born to do, is to, they, they know they're animals. Like, they're fascinated. Like, you know, they bleed, animals bleed. They poop, animals poop. That's like, they're, they're very conscious of their animal-like qualities. And they're very, very curious about living things. And my, my first child, when, when he was in second grade, we used to get, he had a teacher, it was one of those workshop teacher, work, worksheet teachers where you couldn't go out to play at recess unless you finished all your worksheets. And Sam never finished his worksheets because he was looking out the window and we get these notes home saying, Sam is being too daydreamy in class. And I would write back and say, we think this is one of Sam's greatest traits <laughs> as a human being. You know, this is a child who, as it's still in diapers, could squat and watch an anthill for 30 minutes. Or, you know, he, I think that all, that we would learn a lot from children if we only wanted to. Question right there in the middle. I wanna challenge you a little. Okay. Um, you are willing to go after politicians through thick and thin, but you're giving a bye to your kith and kin and I think that that is really um, not the right thing to do. 
I think you need to challenge those neighbors and those people around you to get off their tushes and get out there and vote and change the world like nobody's business. And the politicians are only as good or bad as the people who vote for them. I think it's a pretty reductive way of thinking about political identity, but I certainly, it's not an accusation I haven't heard a number of times. That's all I'll say on that subject. Other questions? I, I will remind everybody that uh, Margaret's gonna sign books. So afterwards, if you'll line up right there. Okay. Margaret, thank you for coming up to the snow. Um, I'm a Vanderbilt graduate, and so. Go Vols. Um, for my, reminding the Nashville scene. I'm interested if you'd be willing to share a little bit about your craft as a writer, um, as a person who observes or is present to the natural world, do you find a tension with the amount of time all that takes? And if you would love to have more time to write or more time to be in the natural world. You know, I used to think that my my uh, tendency to stare out windows and watch birds building nests or squirrels licking thistle seed out of a feeder one seed at a time was procrastination. Now I just call it my process. I think it's part of what I'm required to do or I, I, I don't have anything to write about. And it's... Um, you know, I, I keep a notebook in every bag I have. I, and, and I really love the notes feature on my iPhone. Because sometimes I walk and thoughts will occur to me on the way home or back, you know, when I'm still walking and I can just dictate to myself those thoughts. But they wouldn't come if I weren't there, if I weren't looking out the window, if I weren't walking. And, um, so over the years, I've just sort of thought that was part of it. It was just the way it works for me. I don't get too many ideas just sitting at a desk. Uh, question right there. Um, OK, so I was inspired by the wildflowers at my feet and songbirds of my trees, because you talk about your pollinator garden. And my father lives in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and he took up his whole yard, and it's a whole pollinator garden. Oh, God bless him. And he's out there trying to inspire the residents of Sioux Falls, South Dakota to do the same thing. <laughs> he loves it. And we go there, and I know every wildflower there is, and I see all the bees and everything you're talking about. Have you been able to inspire people in your area to do the same thing? No. <laughs> Not at all. It's very discouraging. Um, but others have said that they've changed, just not in my immediate neighborhood. But, um, you know, the thing I learned as a school teacher, I was a, I was a high school English teacher for 10 years. Uh, there was always, in every class, there's one, there's one student who would just glom onto me, whose eyes never left my face. And... Later, years later, they would say, oh, you were the teacher that changed my life, and I would remember that child, and I would remember that it wasn't me. It was that I happened to be in the place saying the thing that that student needed to hear at that moment. And so a lot of, like, convincing people about pollinator gardens or convincing people about book bands, a lot of it, people can only hear what they're ready to hear. And you can talk, and you can demonstrate, um, but you can't, you can't drag anybody kicking and screaming to a particular position. And I think about, and we were talking earlier down in the green room, or somewhere I was thinking, talking about this, I, it suddenly dawned on me that I now understand in a way I didn't when I was a student what Percy Shelley meant in the defense of poetry when he said, Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. I think what he meant was you can make a law, but if you can't change someone's heart, the law won't work. 
And so I do think we need legislation, and I absolutely do, but I also think we need stories, and we need poems, and we need songs, and people will come along. That's my hope. People will come along. It might not be at the, at the speed I would like. Do you want to tell the story of the neighbor with the leaves? <laughs> Is it fair to speak ill of the dead? <laughs> <laughs> I just think they'd love it. No, our next door neighbor for many years, uh, until this past spring, um, we've been in our house 25 years. Uh, she thinks she used to think we had too many trees. And she appears in this book. I, I tell this story about her. That she would stand in front of our house and look at all the trees in the yard and say, your house can't breathe. <laughs> You have too many, it looks like it can't breathe, it's suffocating, there are too many trees, and I'm thinking, like, well, a house can't breathe, but trees can. Um, but she hated the fact that the way the, the winds always blew the leaves from, my, from our trees into her yard, and she didn't have any trees, really, just one little ornamental, and she was retired, so she'd spend all her time getting up leaves as soon as they fell, and it was this impasse for years and years and years. Um, but I guess at that point you just, she's gonna be mad and there's nothing I can do about it. I just, she did, at one point, she bought these teeny little boxwoods like this big and she planted them along the driveway to sort of be a windbreak, like, <laughs> like to keep the leaves from coming over. <laughs> and I just like shook my head, but you know what, it worked. Like those little boxwoods filled in and the leaves piled up there and she was happier and we were happier, but it was just ridiculous how mad the leaves made her. And, um, but they are, they're the, the leaves feed the trees and they provide cover for the insects, for the overwintering insects or their larvae. And so when the baby birds hatch out in the early spring, they have something to eat because the, the insects have spent the winter, or their larvae have spent the winter in the leaves that fall. And one year we had this terrible, terrible drought. We have a drought every year, but this, this was a really bad year and I called the urban forester and I said, should I be watering these 75 year old trees? Should I be fertilizing them? What should I be doing? And he said, do you, do you rake? I said, no. He said, do you blow? And I said, no. And he said, well, then you don't need to do anything they're fine. They've had everything they need because that's the way, I mean, trees have been fine without us, even in droughts for a long, long time, if they are left to do what they're supposed to do. So, you know, I think that, I really think that people are coming around. They, they don't necessarily want it in their own yards yet, but they're kind of happy that it's in mine. <laughs> All right. Should we sign some books? Thank everybody for being here and for supporting Talking Volumes for the season. Thanks, y'all. Thank you.